This is one of our field trips that we typically take uh, in Geology 127. And we come down and visit the main library, museum, and archives. And this is where we, we start. And one of the first questions that I'm gonna ask you is, take a look at the rock on the outside and I'm gonna walk over and zoom in so you can actually see it. But it has a really interesting quality to it and you'll be able to see it uh, when we get close. So here's the outside of the museum. And what you want to take a look at is what's the grain size? Okay, I'll put my finger there so you can see it. It's got a pretty coarse grain. It's mostly light colored. The pink is feldspar. The white is and gray is quartz. The black is hornblende and biotite. But so we know that it's got a relatively coarse grain to it. But I want you also to notice it has another property. It has a property of these swirling lines that go through it. And consequently, we might be enticed if we just look at a small spot to call it a granite because we have light color, coarse grain. But if we actually back up and look at it, we see a completely different pattern in the rocks. And that might lead a geologist to call it a nice, like the metamorphic rock rather than granite. And if you look at all the surface, you see all that swirling pattern. And I'm not a specialist in metamorphic or igneous rocks, but if I was looking at it and I was gonna call it, I'd call it a nice. And you can form your own opinion. Okay, this is a great exhibit. This shows all the different kinds of granite that has been quarried or excavated in Maine. Well, maybe not all of it, but it's a really good representative example. And what you can see here is there's a lot of different aspects of what is called, I don't wanna to walk too fast, you'll get sick. But this exhibit says finished granite. And in the exhibit, I'll focus on this one. Well, I got my shadow in that one. I'll look at this one. And what you can see up at the top is this surface has been polished, like you'd see in a monument or a staircase or something like that. And down at the bottom, this is what it looks like when it comes out of the ground. And when it comes out of the ground, what we have basically is a quarry. And here's an exhibit of a quarry. And if you happen to ever go have dinner in, in Hollowell, you'll see there's Slate's restaurant and there's the quarry tap room. And inside the quarry tap room, there's some great exhibits of mining uh, or, or quarrying granite. And what starts out is uh, beginning to drill holes down in through the rock. And that's not a simple task. And then they break it by either driving some wedges in it that actually push it apart or just using uh, something to detonate the blast it apart. But you can see the gentleman here is actually putting some metal pins in and then they put a steel pin in the middle and they pound that and continually pound the pegs. And ultimately what it does is it causes the rock to break. And there's an example of that. They split the slabs off in the thickness that they want to make. You can see it up here at the top, just smaller pieces. And then there's the really deep drilled holes and you can see them from the side over here. And that's how they quarry granite. And then they got to move it. So in the beginning, when they first started doing this, they used big cranes like this one that you can see in the background. And there's a really good example of a complete one of these along the river in Hollowell, just a couple of miles from here in the Maine State Museum. They were picked up by these cranes and then loaded onto a wagon like this. You can see the big hunk of granite underneath. Probably weighs five or 600 pounds, maybe more. We could calculate the mass of it if we know the density of the rock and we measured the um, different aspects of that piece of granite. Maybe I'll do that sometime. 
But coming back to these different kinds of granite, um, one of the things you'll learn is granite is usually coarse grained. You can see the different minerals. You can see the pink felspars. You can see the black hornblende. You can see the gray quartz. Uh, that indicates that the magma that these rocks formed from cooled underground because rock is a really poor conductor of heat and it takes a long time for liquid rock to cool down at depth. This one is a little bit different because this one says it's got um, plagioclase, lab labradorite, it's got diopside, amphibole, uh, mica, magnetite quartz, and some minor pyrite. In here, those are all mafic minerals. They're dark colored. So technically, is this a granite? I'll let you figure that out. This one over here is another one, light colored. Another dark colored one. If I go back and do this so you actually have time to read the labels, you might have a better opportunity at this. It actually does talk about what the rock names are. And we as lay people tend to call these things granites and just lump them all together. It's like anything that flies through the air is a bird, right? Somebody that knows the difference between birds will know the difference between a red-tailed hawk and a red-shinned hawk, or the distance between a bald eagle and a blue jay. Um, what we try to do is refine our understanding of the rocks that we look at. And you'll see that on the map here, you might have to look at this carefully, you can see where the rocks came from. You can see the different textures. Textures is how we describe the grain size in igneous rock. And what I want you to do is figure out which one was quarried the closest to Waterville. And the other question is, I want you to answer is, are all these rocks granite? Or are they some other type of igneous rock based on the composition, which we tell from the color and the texture, which we tell from the grain size? Okay. It would be nice if we didn't have to stay six feet apart. I like that, the nice geologic humor. One other resource that was extensively used in Maine and harvested and used as an economic resource was ice. And you can actually go some places and watch them harvest ice in the winter. What they would do is they would go out with a, a horse or a plow and the horse would pull the plow across the ice. It would cut uh, grid lines onto the ice and then it would come back with an ice saw that you can see up here hanging from the the ceiling and they would use that along the lines and cut through and then they would ultimately take these chunks of ice put them in an ice house and then ship it to the caribbean to the south any place that they needed some refrigeration and that was an economic research resource um, and, and that was something that they would send ice to the caribbean or the south and they would have a ship that had space in it and one of the things that, or a couple of the things they brought back were things like molasses and rum because that stuff was made in the Caribbean or in the South. And you can see some of the tools here. There's ice tongs up there. They would grab them out of floating in the water. And the Kennebec was used in the winter and a lot of the lakes around here were used to harvest ice. So that's something that we don't really think about anymore, but it was a significant resource uh, in the early 1900s and the late 1800s. If you wanted a cold drink and you didn't have a refrigerator, and this is how a refrigerator worked, it was kind of inverted. You put the ice up in the top and it cooled down, melted, and then the cool air went down into the bottom chamber and kept your food cold. So there's a little history on. And in here, in here we have the main state mineral. The main state mineral is tourmaline. And tourmaline is a silicate mineral. 
It occurs usually in the pegmatites in Maine. Pegmatite is kind of an interesting rock. It's a very coarse grain material. Uh, if you go in the lab and go up by the screen in the front, right on the floor by the screen is a big piece of, of pegmatite and it has some large black tourmalines in it, those rectangular black things. And tourmaline comes in a variety of colors. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's green, most, a lot of times it's black. But in this particular exhibit, these green and pink units, the ones that occur together, are called watermelon tourmaline because that's kind of what it looks like is the green is the rind of the uh, watermelon and the pink is the inside. And if you look at this necklace, you can kind of, there we go. Uh, most of that is made of green tourmaline and it is, uh, the jewelry itself is made of gold and the gold was collected from I want to say the Swift, yeah, the Swift River, and it was actually panned out. You can go and do that. Uh, it was made by Admiral Perry, made the necklace to give to his wife for, his, for her 50th birthday. So some native material, all used for a very beautiful purpose uh, in producing a necklace. And then... The tourmaline is carved into and faceted with different um, types of surfaces. And you see the different colors there. And the minerals here are backlit, so there's lights behind, and the light penetrates the mineral, so you can actually see it. And I talk about some of the other minerals here. Another mineral that's excavated, can't really see it here, is gold. Barrel is a mineral that's found in Maine. And you see the big specimen up at the top of the screen right here. It's got six sides. Beryl is a hexagonal mineral. It puts its elements together in a six-sided orientation. Garnet is another common mineral in Maine. And amethyst as well. Amethyst, I don't want to break it to you, but amethyst is just a quartz that has some uh, impurities in it that make it purple and here's some other types of quartz your smoky quartz and rose quartz is pink quartz and then we get down here to citrine which is yellow quartz and milky quartz is white 